Right. Ah, hello, everybody. Welcome to Mark's Remarks live stream. Now, this is going to be something a bit different. I've, uh, I've, I've pulled out possibly half my DVD collection. I've got it all stacked up here. I'm going to be pulling them out one by one. What I've done, I've tried to mix them up. So I, I'm not going to be sure what I'm going to get. Now, I'll just look at the thing and probably tell you a little bit about it. Now, a lot of these DVDs I haven't watched for years, so I'm going to be going by um, memory. But I've got a pretty good memory when it comes to movie details, you know. Um, I can remember the plot line and who was in what. Anyway, but uh, let's see. All right, before I get going, uh, <coughs> oh, got, got George C. in the house. Uh, did you get Monster? Oh, Sean Kingham. Uh, when am I going to get Monster Energy? I don't know. Uh, well, well, the thing is, I'm always down the shop, so I'm always trying to find new drinks and new chocolate bars and new flavor crisps, you know, to do stuff. So if I see something new, I went to the shop today, and uh, the, the co-op didn't have any. Uh, they got a very small selection of fizzy drinks. Uh, oh, I po anybody interested? I posted off that. Yesterday turns out to be a bank holiday, right? I went down the post office like a dummy. Turns out to be... Bank holiday, they're closed, so uh, I had to go. <clears throat> had to go back today, but I've posted off the postcard to uh, Boris Johnson. Remember uh, on the last live stream, I I put it on the back of a gammon box of gammon. Made a postcard out of that, put a stamp on it, sent it off. So he'll get that in a few days. Although he's out of hospital now, but uh, but if anybody wants to send one, you know, like I did, go right ahead. Just Jen uh, says it's buffing again. Uh, I tell you, I'm going to have to ring up the uh, internet people. Uh, Batesy Boyo uh, says, uh, good time to go live. I've just rolled a tomato. <laughs> yeah. Actually, it's funny enough, I've repotted all my, well, most of my uh, tomato plants. Uh, one of them looks like he's on his last legs, but I repotted the small ones. Uh, Martin DB5. Is in the house. Uh, I see Sean Kingham's back again. Do I like? I don't know what that is. M O A A M S. I don't know what that. Uh, Terry Webster, Scotty B, will be watching on the rerun. Ah, uh, Scotty B will be watching on the rerun later on. Okay. Hopefully, the the last the last live stream I did. Uh, it took like a day and a half to load. Uh, it was crazy. You know, I don't know what it is. Maybe there's lack of staff down at the uh, internet depot, you know, the uh, YouTube uh, where, uh, building. Just Jenna. No, I'm not on the vodka. That's a bit early. I'm, I'm just going to be drinking a bit of water, maybe a bit of blackcurrant juice thrown in there. Um. All right, do you do I smoke? No, Sean Kingham. No, I haven't smoked a cigarette in it's be, be ten years now. Yeah, I was about forty when I gave up. Uh, coming up on fifty in um, was it now? In a uh, month and a half. So it'll be ten years. Adam Palfrey, have I watched Tiger King? No. Well, what I did, I, I, I did look up the name Tiger King on YouTube and um, watched a little bit of a bit of footage of him, not necessarily a show, but some some guy making a show of his show. Um, and uh, yeah, it looks a bit crazy. It looks like a, a guy buying all kinds of tigers. He's mixed. He's got a rivalry with some woman who may or may not have killed her husband and fed the body to the lions is, is what the um, suspicion is. You know, it's all a bit fucking crazy. Anyway, all right, look, we're nearly five minutes in. I haven't done any. Um, all right, I'm going to do some. I've got a stack of DVDs, which I'm going to tell you about. If you fancy writing some titles down, by all means, go ahead. You know, um, I mean, the, 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 a lot of the. I mean, I've, I do have some absolute creme de month in the. In the um, in the DVD quality scale, right? But but some of them are passable, some of them are good, but some of them are really good. 
So there's different degrees of quality. Um, year one. There we go. We got Jack and Michael Sierra on the uh, over there. Uh, yeah, this is basically. <clears throat> It's kind of like a, it, it's, it's it's a comedy, of course, as you'd imagine. Uh, cavemen, it's year one. You've got your hunters, your gatherers. Um, he's not much good at either. He gets thrown out of his camp, and then on the he has a journey to to basically go out of the because they're, they're only they're only been like five miles around away from their camp, so they think there's nothing else going on in the world. And because he's thrown out of the camp, he goes a bit further, finds some new people. Um, What's his name? I can't think. Uh, the, the, the guy from Ghostbusters, e e Egon. Egon? Uh, um, is, uh, is the leader of another camp, and they meet up with him. Uh, it's similar story to, well, I say similar story. It's got elements of the Mel Gibson one. The, 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 uh, Oh, mine's gone a bit blank now. <laughs> but basically, uh, all his um, towns, all his uh, village folk all get kidnapped. So he's on a quest to go save them and uh, save the day. There's, there's a lot of funny stuff. Cain and Abel are in there. The two, you know, one gets killed by the other two brothers. Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, they go into that city. There's all kinds of, uh, you know, sacrificing and all this kind of caper. There's some very good, uh, very good comedy stuff. Uh, Vinnie Jones does a bit part in here. Okay, uh, let's see what we got. Ah, now this is one of my favorite movies, Men at Work. Uh, Charlie Sheen, Emilio Estevez, two brothers in real life, but they're playing uh, work colleagues in here. Two bin men, and uh, actually, when you when you sort of say it out loud, two bin men it doesn't really sound too entertaining. But what it is, they're two bin men, and they're, they're kind of like not very serious about their job, you know, uh, they, they, they're going around doing the bins, throwing bowling balls down the alleys and all this, basically having a good time in their job, which is not something that we sort of do anymore. <laughs> um, believe me, I've worked on the bins and it's, it's, it's not, it's not fun at all. Uh, let me see. And, and then of course, and then you've got to, so you've got their story and their, their rivalry with their co-workers. They're always pulling pranks on each other and exploding, exploding dog turds in the lockers you know they fill it out with um you know <laughs> little bit exploding bags and, and stuff in their uh, in their lockers and, and then there's a side story of hello miss buffered again uh, they got a side story of, of a, a politician he's wise to these people who are uh tipping toxic waste into the local pond he's not having it he gets you know killed and then he ends up in the rubbish bin stuffed in a rubbish bin waiting you know these two happen along and find the dead body and uh you know get away from the killer very it, it is funny it is a funny film you know it's it's one of those things one of those films that maybe slip past the radar. i'm trying to think it must be mid 80s man it says nine uh yeah it says 1990 the copyright picture is so I was going to say mid eighties, but uh, yeah, about ninety. Anyway, but definitely worth a go. Quite a funny film. Let's see what we got. Crash. Now this I can't really tell you a whole lot about. I, I watched it. This is like so many years ago since I watched this, but I can tell you that it's a bit like um, Magnolia, the movie. Not like the movie Magnolia, but in the way that there's lots of different stories going on all at the same time and they interact with each other. You know, you've got, um, I remember Sandra Bullock, her and her husband, who's not on the front of the thing here. She is, she, she's been uh, burgled or been a victim of a crime. So she's looking to get the house locks changed and it's her, interaction with her husband and the uh, Mexican who's doing the locks. She doesn't trust the Mexican. And, you know, and, and that leads on to other stories and it intermingles on that line with other stories. It's, uh, I mean, I did like it last time I saw it, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's quite good. So it's not one story going all the way through. There's like, you know, maybe two, three, four stories 
individual, but then they inter interlink. So the characters will cross over. Um, yeah, worth a go. I mean, it's a long time since I saw it. So I can't really tell you too much. What's this? Oh, Sling Blade. There you go. <laughs> now, this is a very unusual film. Now, Billy Bob Thornton here on the, uh, there he is. When he was a child, well, his character, when his character was a child, uh, let me see. I, was, I got audio. What are, you, what are you saying? You got audio, but not visual. Uh, anyone else not s subbed to Spice and Easy, please? Uh, I think people are saying they got audio. Anyway, uh, I'll, I'll keep going. Now, when Billy Bob Thornton's character was a child, sort of like, uh, I don't know, eight or nine, I guess, he killed his mother's boyfriend, I guess. Uh, I'm not sure if he killed his, I think he might have killed, uh, maybe killed his mum, but so. Anyway, so he goes into a loony house and he's been there for the last uh, 30 years, you know. They finally let him out, okay, but, it, but he's not a deranged killer. He's just a bit, uh, you know, it's like a, what you might call a sandwich short of a picnic. I mean, he won't have had the greatest of education because he's been in the, uh, the, the nutty house all these years. But they finally let him out because they figure he's uh, no longer a, a, a menace to society. Although he wasn't a psycho killer, he just happened to do that one thing because he thought he was doing the right thing at the time. Uh, he get, gets let out and uh, befriends, a, a, befriends a kid. Who's on the back there? There he is on the carrying the laundry. Gets uh, introduced to their family. He's settling in. He gets a job at a garage. He settles in with the boys, uh, the, the, with the boy and the uh, the, the boy's mum, and her boyfriend, who's real abusive. And uh, yeah, the, the story's about the the, the um, Billy Bob Thornton and the kids' friendship. You know, because basically Billy Bob Thornton's a child in the uh, in the mental age group so he's you know he's similar in age in mentally to the to the kid and uh how you know he's got to you know he's got to deal with um the 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 the, the mum's boyfriend uh john ritter john ritter's in there who's of course dead now um he was in three's company i believe the tv show um Let's see, written. Oh, my eyes are written. It's very small writing on the back. Jesus Christ. Written for the screen and directed by so uh, Billy Bob Thornton. So as his um he he directed this and wrote it. Uh, very good. Uh, I, I don't want to tell you too much, but um, but he kind of he, he goes he reverts back to his old ways. But in order, he does a bad thing, but for a good reason, you know, because the, the, the kid's abusive. Not his stepdad, but his uh, mum's boyfriend. Uh, what's this? Oh, Dust Till Dawn. There we go. This is the first out of, I don't know, three, th th at least three. The, 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 they did one that went back in time as a Western. This one's very good because it's uh, one of Tarantino's first ones, first movies. Uh, he's in it, of course, playing uh, one of the two brothers along with uh, George Clooney. Uh, there's Harvey Keitel, Juliette Lewis in there. It starts off as a bank robbing sort of, you know, there are a couple of psychos basically going around robbing, robbing banks, robbing places, kill anybody that gets in their way. And you're thinking, you know, how can we root for them? They're a bunch of the power of killers, especially Tarantino. He's just an out and out psycho, whereas brother Clooney, he's a killer, but he doesn't kill on the whim. He, he'll do it for, you know, he'll kill you straight away. But for a reason, you know, whereas Tarantino here will just do it because you're there. there. And uh, anyway, so, so they're, they're robbing banks, uh, they're, they're getting chased by the police across the border, and there are a couple of mean characters, 
but so it's, it's hard to root for them until they go to the uh, biker bar on the way to Mexico. And then they, they um, all mayhem ensues where um, as soon as the door, you know, what they do, the, 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 <laughs> the biker bar nightclub thing is, is, is run by a bunch of vampires. So of course what they're doing they're they're, they're attracting all these lorry drivers in for a stop, you know, and have a few drinks and dinners and that. And then basically they kill them all. And then, that, you know, and then rob all their stuff. And they've been doing this for hundreds of years, you know, by looking at all the trucks and the, uh, the stuff they've all hoarded. Uh, it's just an, a great action flick that goes from bank robbing psycho nutters into blood sucking vampires and their fight because they're in the, in the building and they're basically trying to survive until daybreak, you know, very good action. You know, a, bit, a little bit of humour thrown in, but it's not a comedy film by any stretch. This is a bit of dark humour. What's this one? Ah. Oh. Any Which Way But Loose. Now, this is one of two or three they've done on the same lines. Any Which Way But Loose, Any Which Way You Can was another one. I don't know if there was a third. But uh, it's, uh, of course, it's Clint Eastwood. And he's got a he's got a pet orangutan. He's a he's a um, he, he makes his money by being a bare knuckle fighter. That's how he makes his money. Actually, this is uh, I brought this up on one of my um, movie quiz questions that I did on the on the live stream once. Uh, bare knuckle fighter. He does a bit of mechanics on the side. Basically, he's a bit of a handyman. Um, but him and his brother whose name I don't, uh, he's not on the, his name will be on the back somewhere. I'm not sure what his name is, but uh, yeah, his name is Philo Bedo. And um, yeah, he, his brother in the, in the, in the film, he's the one who organized the fights for him. So he'll go travel around, do some bare knuckle fighting. And that's apparently how he, he uh, managed to come across Clyde, the orangutan. He won him in a fight, you know. So, uh, but yeah, just some, you know, just some good wholesome. And of course, they get mixed up with the bikers, the black widows, if uh, my memory serves. Um, he has an accident, you know, with, with them, and then they, you know, he, he Fido Bedos on the shit list of the of the bikers. And of course, they're a bunch of like Keystone Cop type bikers. You know, they're pretty useless. Uh, that they, they try to be a tough group of bikers, but but they're not. But uh, there's a bit of a rivalry through, you know, through there. Yeah. There you go. Not not too bad of a film, you know, if you're on a good, wholesome. What's this? Oh, this one. You know what? I haven't even seen this one. I'll put this back over here. I haven't even watched that one. Uh, multiplicity. There we go. Michael Keaton, who, who was in there with a play, the Batman all those years ago. Um, it's just a, a comedy, light-hearted, you know, was it like, it must be an hour and a half, turn your brain off kind of thing. This guy, Michael Keaton, he, he works as a, a contractor, building, building houses. I'm not sure if he owns a company or something, but he probably is in higher management at least. Uh, Building houses, and it, it's one of those where, you know, that there's too much work, not enough hours in the day, one of those themes. So what he does, uh, but because he, he's trying to fit in as much work as he can, he's up to his ears in in, in work. His wife's uh, on him, try, you know, because she wants more of his time. It's just mayhem. He just not enough hours in the day. So what he does, he goes to he, he goes to a, a scientist who's got this new idea of uh, basically like cloning people. Can't remember exactly how he does it, um, but he can clone people. So what he does, he clones Michael, can it Michael Keaton? And then he's got a, him and his twin brother, you know, but basically well, he's cloned, you know? So now one's at work, one's at home, sorting out the, you know, dealing with the bullshit with a wife. Um, and then, of course, you know, he's thinking, well, you know, if two is doing this, maybe three will be even better. So then one can go to work, one can spend time with a wife, and he can just basically have some time off, go, you know, fishing and, you know, go, you know, go 
whatever the hell he wants to do. And then, of course, it goes on more and more. And I think he ends up with four in uh, well, the, I think he has three clones plus himself. But it's but the problem is it's like when it's like Xerox machines, you know, you, or, or or going from tape to tape on a, on a D, uh, v, uh, VHS. If you do a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy, Grace, eventually down the line, you start to degrade the quality, which is what happens with the twins. Um, you know, the, the, one of them's one of them's really good, really caring. The other one's a bit of a ter- basically. It's, it's like his personality, different traits of your personality. One is more outgoing. One is more thoughtful. One is more hardworking. That kind of thing. While normally they're all crammed into one person, now they're separated into three different people. So um, none of them are copies of him as such. Or at least they are, but not his personality. You know. But one has certain traits. One has another certain tr- set of traits. There you go. And uh, Andy McDowell's in there. You know. Okay. Ah. Oh. With nail and eye. Actually, it, uh, this is. Oh, people talking amongst themselves. Okay. Um, yeah. With nail and eye. Now. This is one of what you, what I would call the the quality film. This is one that I uh, I watch every now and again. It is so good. It's one of those which is typical English film where, as opposed to certain foreign films that we shall not be named, they rely on special effects to sell the movie. This is just a good story. Two guys living, I mean, this is back in the 70s, okay? Uh, they're living in a big boarding house, uh, you know, where basically a big house is subdivided into, you know, uh, living. You, basically, everything you need is within your rooms there. You've got your own lounge, your own kitchen, you know, it's all, you know, you've got like a, a an eight-bedroom, super huge house but it's been subdivided into you know so you've got eight different tenants in there anyway these two are sharing one apartment they're two struggling actors uh richard e grant here standing up um paul mccann down here and uh richard griffiths which i think he plays the gay uncle which is a really funny scene uh anyway the, the these two are struggling actors, right? They're getting by. Um, they're, they're so. How would, how would you describe it? When you've got, well, they're both in the thing, right? And they'll do they'll do their drugs, and there's a time when they're out of drugs. So um, to get high, Richard E. Grant here drinks. Uh, I think he drinks uh, petrol lighter. You know, like is it you know like Zippo lighter or meths or one of those you know for flammable liquids? He drinks that for the alcohol <laughs> because he's um he's such a you know loser, I guess. Um, they de- that they desperately want a. I'm not really selling this very well, but I'm, I'll tell you, it, it is worth a go. They desperately want to get out of the town because nothing's going right for them. Uh, the, 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 so you know their, their apartment's dingy, their life is shit. So they figure we'll just get out of the house. We'll, we'll, we'll go down to the uncle. Uh, we'll go down to the, um, the the country to visit Richard E. Grant's uncle, who happens to be a big bull faggot. Okay. Uh, so what he does in order to prov- in order to uh, persuade his uncle to let them go down there. Let me just click this. Uh, he tells his uncle that his friend here is a homo as well so he's basically click this off. so he says to his uncle that his uh, he, he can have his friend <laughs> he can bum his friend if he lets them come down stay there for the weekend drink all his booze eat all his food basically have a have a weekend in the country and uh anyway so but of course his friend doesn't know about this until he actually gets to <laughs> funny as fuck um yeah and, and you've got the um you got lots of other characters who are just, you know, basically low life who are milling around the uh, the uh, at the house. They come in, they get stoned. Um, 
one of them roles, uh, he was in Alien 3. What, what you know, the uh, uh, what was he? He, 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 had a, he had a name in Alien 3 that was a number, he's obviously it's IQ. That one, um, 70, you know, 23 or something. Uh, anyway, he he rolled because he, he's a real drug drug user, and it's like you know, the, the makeup of this guy is really good because it, it was. I saw a documentary on this program where he was described that character was described as a train wreck behind the eyes. His eyes look totally fucked because of all the drugs. And he's making a, 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 a Camberwell carrot he's making, which consists of like, uh, I don't know, seven rolling joint papers, you know, <laughs> it's crazy. Camberwell carrot. And there's a big argument about, uh, you know, wanting to wanting to buy some of the drugs and, you know, but uh, it's just funny stuff. It's, it's not an out and out comedy by all means. It's just dark humor, which I like. You know, when they play it straight, when 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 characters play comedy straight, it's up to you to find the humor in it, which is what I like. You know, you know, like a lot of comedies that out and out, you know, funny. They're telling you when to laugh because it's all funny. Ha ha. But you're actually laughing at the predicament that these people in not all the time. It's, uh, you know. But uh, what else would there be? Uh, what's his name? Elphick. There used to be a show. I can't see his name. Uh, Michael. He's uh, Michael Elphick's in it. He, he had a TV show back in the eighties. I don't know if anybody remembers that, but well worth a watch. If you ever watch, if you ever to get the chance, um, watch that movie. Okay, Tremors. Now, my favourite out of there's five of them now, and a TV show with the uh, the Doc from Back to the Future. He's in it. You know, uh, this is the first. I like these kinds of movies. You know, buddy movies. There's two main characters. Uh, there's a singer called Ruby McIntyre. She sings the ending song to this. Plus Michael Gross or Gro Gross or Gross. He's in it. Uh, Fred Ward and uh, Kevin Bacon is in it. All right, so you got, you got about what's that? Two, four, four main characters, and uh, but about six or so characters that come in, do their thing, you know. Uh, but the basic idea that they're in the they're in the uh, outback of I don't know what I want to say Arizona somewhere outback. They're they're in, the, they're in the mountains, right? These are people who don't want to be living in the towns. They set up home in the mountains or in the you know the wilderness types. You know, but basically there's a little town there and they live in or around the town. And these guys, these two, Earl and Ward, Earl, well, wait, uh, yeah, Earl, I can't, oh, shit, I can't see the other name. Anyway, anyway but, but, but these two, Kevin Bacon and uh, Ward, they're handy men. Uh, they just make a living bumming around, you know, they're, they're, they're perfectly happy. They they do odd jobs to basically pay for their lager, you know, and the rest of the time they're just sitting around um, basically, you know, enjoying a, a carefree life. Most the only thing you've got to worry about is get enough handy jobs to uh, put petrol in the car and booze in the fridge. And they're loving it. You know, they, they sleep, you know, basically if they're, if they're doing an odd job doing some um, fencing for a farmer, they'll just, just uh, keep in the in the uh, back of the open flatbed lorry overnight, you know, it's that kind of life, you know. But until some graboids, underground creatures like worms, they're coming across and they're, they're basically moved away through the dirt and they come up and they, they're attracted to sound or vibration. So footsteps, sheep, uh, people walking, cars, radios, they're all caused vibrations. And they come up and they grab them and they eat them. It's uh, it's kind of it's not an, it is a comedy, but it's more of an action comedy, you know. Worth a go. Um, the other the, the rest of them are okay. Up until you get to five, five not so good. Four, I think, was uh, one of them went back in time to the origins back in the cowboy times. That was three, I believe. Um, but yeah, Bert Gummer who's played by Gross. Uh, he, he's a gun enthusiast. He's got hundreds of guns. He's got thousands of ammo. He's, he's one of these survivalists, you know, and uh, so he's the only one with any decent firepower. 
around. Worth a go. All right. Let's see. I'll uh, pick one at random over here. What we got here? Ah, ID. There you go. This is another one. <laughs> Just looking at the looking at the photograph on the back there. That that's him shouting because he's uh, screaming at the other football team. ID. Uh, a film back in the eighties when when uh, I would imagine we still have football hooliganism. I don't really see it a whole lot because I don't really watch telly, you know. Uh, but back in the eighties, when when we had the the problem with the uh, a big problem with hooliganism, this is a movie about an undercover policeman over here. Uh, he goes undercover, part of a group. Uh, going in, infiltrating the, the pub where the hooligans, this guy here's the landlord, he's a bit of a thick shit, he's the landlord and part-time hooligan, you know. Um, basically, he, he infiltrates the group, gets in there with the uh, with, with the with the leaders of the mob, and basically he, he's intelligence gathering, you know. But the, the thing is, because he because he goes in with a group, he's, he's doing a lot of drinking, doing a lot of, you know, violence, and this kind of thing going on, football riots, he gradually befriends the people who he's, you know, supposedly infiltrating. So he becomes friends and the line between police and football hooligans starts to get blurred, you know, because he's taking his football hooliganism, hooliganism mannerisms back home to his wife. She doesn't like that. Um, but yeah, you know, it's an 18 certificate. There's... Uh, not a lot of gratuitous violence as such. There's just a lot of hooliganism. There's hundreds of people in the street all wrecking a bus of the other team. There's there's lots of uh, running down the streets. There's some violence in it, of course. But, uh, you know, worth a go. They did make a sequel years later where there's a, there's a character in here called Gumbo. Right? He's, he's a bit of a... Uh, well, I suppose retarded, I guess, would be the best. Uh, basically, he's, he's in the group. Uh, the, 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 the group just bring, you know, lets him hang about. He doesn't really do any fighting with him. They just, he just likes to be in a group with people who want to be around him because they don't want to be around him. They just bring him in because he's a goof, you know. But he's just in it for the, uh, you know, the social interaction. He, uh, Gumbo, was uh, in the sequel years later, like 10 years later. When, of course, what they do, they go in again, they try it again, but this time it's with a, an Indian uh, policeman. And it's all about the, the, the sequel. Well, I don't know the sequel too much, but the sequel was all about how foreigners have a bad time. It's all about, oh, yeah, well, the white man is totally racist against the Indian. It's, you know, one of those really banging it on the head that, um, you know, you can't be an Indian without being hassled by the police or, you know, it's fucking shit. But Gumbo's in it. He's about the only original character. Uh, but this one, worth a go, you know? All right. I won't, I won't, I won't, I'm not, I won't even look. That's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm just grabbing one off the... won't even look until I uh, get it. Ah! There you go. Actually, it's... Uh... Actually, let me just have a quick look at the... Oh, Andy Smith, the gay, yeah, Andy Smith there, the, the gay, the gay uncle scene was hilarious. <laughs> Imagine, that was, a, that was um, Richard E. Grant selling his friend's ass for a free weekend in the country. That's what that scene boiled down to. Oh, I mean, what a, what a scum, what a scuzz. Imagine selling your friend's ass just for a free weekend of booze and uh, fresh air in the country. I mean, uh What's this? Uh, let me just. Uh... Oh, Sir Dudes a lot. What's with all the homophobic slurs? Well, I don't think. You see, the thing is, the, the definition of homophobic is fear of. I don't think any of my slurs or commentary on that video was anything to do with being afraid of the character that was in the film. So um, I think you may have misunderstood there. Yeah, homophobic. Look it up. It means fear of. Okay, it is an overword. Have you ever heard of arachnophobic? What is that? No, that's a fear of spiders. Um, 
uh, claustrophobic fear of enclosed spaces. Okay, it means fear of. There was no fear of in my description of uh, with nail and I. Okay, it means fear of. Doesn't mean irrational fucking uh, whatever irrational dislike. You see, this is what I'm telling you. That the the, the, the use. Look up the word arachnophobic and claustrophobic. Uh, claustrophobic. Claustrophobic. Uh, fear of. Fear of spaces. Fear of spiders. There are lots of other phobias. Okay. Um, anyway. Yeah. If you, if, anyway, just look it up. All right. This story, The Breakfast Club, one that you really should see. It, but the basic idea is it's uh, it, it showed the, the, the story starts Saturday morning, eight o'clock. All these kids about I think it's eight of them, six, six of them. They all are doing a detention on a Saturday morning. All right? So all get dropped off. They're all doing it. But basically, what they've got to go in there and basically sit there for eight hours and write a little essay about um, you know what they're doing there. And basically, you've got like. Uh, well, actually, well, we're five. I said six. You've got five. Five characters. They're all different characters. They don't know each other, except for they've seen them in in distances. Uh, like the, the, this one's the uh, the the you know the uh, I don't know. Which she's got the you know the popular girl. This guy's the nerd. This guy's the the jock. The he's the wrestler. She's the outcast. Uh, sort of like you know a bit, bit of a goth at the beginning beginning and he's the tear away he's the criminal you see um if there's a you know if there's a fire to be lit he'll light you know that kind of thing um so they start off on uh detention they go in they basically got to sit there you've got your teacher who's hassling them uh and but basically they they spend the whole day and the whole day is spent these people getting to know each other you know, because normally they, they, they their paths never cross. You know, they might see each other from a distance, but they never speak. They're they're all from a different group. Each one has their own group of people that they hang around with. Um, and, and admittedly, I'm not really selling that well, but it is a very good movie. I like these kind of movies where you've got six people and you've got time to understand their characters they're not running off coming in and coming back and going off and doing something else and somebody else comes in you've got five characters who you get to really understand and by the end of it they pretty they all change you know she's the stuck up um you know come from a, a rich well-to-do family she sort of settles down you know she sees that these people are actually human after all you know um the goth turns into you know she's not you know it's quite a uh, not a bad looking girl you know once she gets her hair combed and you know anyway but uh there you go i'm underselling it but it's worth uh definitely is worth going for okay oh they're still buffing apparently Yeah. Okay, I'll keep going. Let's see. The proposal. There we go. Now this anything with Pierce, uh, uh, Pierce. Uh, oh shit. Guy Pierce. It's got Guy Pierce, Ray Winston, Danny Houston. Danny Houston was in the uh, Thirty Days and Thirty Nights. He played that vampire. You know, whether, you know, in the, in the middle of they're in the middle of nowhere and the place goes dark for 30 days and the vampires come in. That's Danny Houston. Uh, John Hurt. He's in it. Uh, Emily Watson and David, somebody whose name is covered by this uh, sticker. There you go. That's um, that's Danny Houston there. And that is uh, Guy Pierce behind the sticker. Yeah. Set in Australia. It's got to be set in. Um, the, the the late I'm trying to look on the date on the back here uh, uh, where it, it's when it, the, the, these are these are it's, it's the uh, Ray Winston plays a, a police officer a police captain he's come over and his job is to police 
the police force, keep the Aborigines under control. Uh, apparently, they're having a bit of a problem with the settlers who are settling their farmsteads in Australia. They're, uh, they're, they're getting murdered by all the um, uh, Aborigines, you know. So uh, so the police force is in there. They've got to sort of straighten them out. Uh, Guy Pierce and Danny Houston are brothers, along with another brother. Uh, who, who's uh, and, and basically they, they're, they're criminals. They're, they're just murderers, and they're being chased by the police. Um, yeah, I, I tell you, how would I? Um, yeah, we got Danny Houston and Guy Pierce. That they, they're out. That they're out on the run. One of the brothers get caught. Uh, he gets flogged. He gets thrown in prison. And um, Ray Winston says to uh, Guy Pierce, "Go and get your other brother, Danny Houston." bring him in to justice and your other brother, who's basically an, a fucking idiot, uh, he can go free because he's not really in, he, he's not really a criminal. He's just a, you know, and uh, he's just somebody who sort of, you know, hangs along because his two brothers are doing this thing. Uh, he can go because we're not interested in him. You know, he's, he's your brother. So he goes off to get his brother and it looks like he's going to hand his brother into the police. But, um, you know, they, they kind of, you know, there's a bit of, you could definitely say, you know, they're, they're kind of, they're not sort of close as such. I mean, ugh. anyway, so they come back and uh, there's a lot of, a uh, lot of murdering, um, a lot of our Aborigines getting killed. Of course, you know, uh, <clears throat> and some of the Aborigines are, are part of the police force as well. Uh, all set in Australia. And of course, they're dealing with the heat, dealing with the Aborigines, dealing with the flies, dealing with the criminality. It's uh no, it's a good, it's a good, good story. That's what it is. There's plenty of gunfire in there, you know, no explosions. It's just a good story and a really good soundtrack. When they, um, when the two brothers are, are right, you know, they're riding from, you know, he has to go travel a week to go for his brother and then come back. Um, that some of the eerie soundtrack is is very uh, compelling. You know, John Hurt's in there. John Hurt plays a bounty hunter. Um. He's a bit of a devious one as well. <laughs> He's one. He won't, you know, he, he, he'll he go in, hit you over the head with a rifle butt and then arrest you, you know, because he, he's not going to go in there. He, he, does, he doesn't do so much talking. I mean, he does interact with uh, Guy Pierce, but he knows straight away he's only talking with Guy Pierce in the canteen uh, while he's waiting for his opportunity to hit him over the head and tie him up and arrest him, you know. Because there's a bounty on him. He's one of those types, you know. He's very, very devious. Uh, oh, good. We haven't heard from that guy earlier. Oh, I heard from him back again. Good. Okay. All right. Let's, uh, let's try this um, one over here. Okay. Ah, uh, semi, semi-pro. Yeah, it's been a while. Semi-pro. Will Farrell here in the middle, Woody Harrelson over here, and uh, some black guy, I don't know who he is. Anyway, but uh, Will Farrell, the, the idea of the story is, um, of course, he's, he's no good as a basketball player. He just doesn't have, um, he's got the enthusiasm, but he doesn't really have the talent. So the only way he's ever going to get played to play basketball in some proper matches you know, on television against proper teams and get some endorsements and basically basically have fun by owning, you know, like a, a lot of these rich, rich people, they'll own a football team or they'll own some kind of sports team. And basically they're so rich, they can do this. And what they do, they just buy it and let them go with it. You know, this guy, <coughs> he's bought a basketball team with a specific, specific reason of playing on the team so no matter how bad he is he's the owner so he he gets to go in there no matter you know so basically he goes in and it's the rest of the team that carries him and they know it and they're fine with it because he's paying the wages he's he's putting them on games that are on television all they got to do is carry his weight on the court and they're okay because they're getting their chance to shine and basically you know try and show their uh, basketball talent to um, uh, uh, you know, talent scouts and whatnot. So, you know, they're all fine. 
So, um, of course, if he didn't own the team, he wouldn't be on there because he's no bloody good. But it's very good. And he bought he bought the team because he, he made us he made a song. Which I've got it in my head, but I can't. Uh, oh, love me sexy. It's called he uh, in the in the film. <coughs> he made a boatload of money on this number one single. This this song, Love Me Sexy, which uh, the money is earning him so much money, he goes out and uses the money to buy a basketball team. You know, so uh, you know, so there's all, there's all kinds of shenanigans in there. He doesn't know what he, he's he's the worst player of the whole lot, but he owns the teams so they can be on there. Woody Harrison, he's a they buy him in exchange for a washing machine, I think. Uh, you know, because the team hasn't got much money, and. Uh, you know, all kinds of shenanigans. They go in and play the games. Uh, there's all kinds of fighting going on because, um, you know, they feel like they're being hard done by by, by the referees and all this. Stuff. But it's comedy, comedy stuff. Okay, let's, uh, let's try this one. Okay, let's have a quick look. Before I see what this is, let's see if there's anything going on in the... Uh, Glyph Glove. You ever seen the Yoda Chronicles? No. No, I'm interested in that new movie with a baby Yoda. That looks interesting. Not for the Yoda, but for the uh, Boba Fett character. He looks he looks quite good. Flip YTP parody. Why do you get dislikes on your videos? I don't know. You know, uh, sometimes I'll I'll load a 12 minute video within four minutes. I get a dislike. You know, people just people just go on there to dislike. What are you, you going to do? It uh, you can't please everybody. But sometimes I'm actually amazed at how quick they are to dislike it, even though they haven't even watched it, which is quite amazing to me sometimes. But but luckily, <clears throat> luckily I've got a good crowd of uh, loyal followers, and um, you know, the thumbs up. If only all of them were thumbs up, it would definitely outweigh the uh, thumbs down. You know, that would be a big help if they. Uh... Terry Webster, it's like a new Barry Norman with swearing. <laughs> yeah, I remember Barry Norman. Yeah, Barry Norman. He was before. Then went on to Jonathan Ross. He did that. Yeah, Barry Norman. That was a. That's a way back. Yeah, because I'm old enough to. Uh, you know. Rambo, the first one out of how many is there now? There was Rambo, Rambo two. Rambo two is when he goes off to Afghanistan. He's, he's doing the stick fighting, I believe. Rambo three. Yeah, shit. I don't know. I remember. Uh, I've got the. I've got the one where he goes off to the Philippines or somewhere, and he. Um, he, where, where, where he's uh, he's, he's taken some commandos down a riverboat. I don't know what number that is. And then, of course, you've got the latest one, which I want to get, uh, which is the one where he's on the far on the farm, and a bunch of Mexicans, uh, you know, try and murder him on the farm. That looks interesting. And he got the tunnels underground. But anyway, but this one, yeah, I tell you, this is. A very good. If you haven't seen this one, it is very good. It's very gritty. Um, there's some explosions, lots of gunfire, but that, that, you know, not in the usual Hollywood way where that's all they got, you know, this is a very good story. <clears throat> Vietnam vet, uh, comes back. He's sort of bumming around, for, you know, basically walking, the, you know, from state to state, basically going from, you know, one town to another. He's not really settling down anywhere. He's looking for his Vietnam, Vietnam mate friend. But when he gets to his home, it, t it turns out that the uh, his, his friend died a while back. So he's oh shit, you know. So uh, so he's back on the road again. He gets uh, so he's on the he's on the road. He gets picked up by the, the by the police, basically because he's not a resident and he's uh, he hasn't got a home there. He's a you know a, what they call it a vagrant. He gets run out of town, you know, uh, by the scumbag sheriff. He doesn't like this. He's thinking, well, this is you know this is America. You know, we, we you don't get told that you've got to leave town. Who the hell do you think? You know, somebody comes back, gets himself arrested, fights all the policemen in the uh, in the police station, jumps on a bike, heads for the hills, and that's where all the mayhem ensues because now he's on a police chase. The police are chasing him. You know, with cars, uh, helicopters, bikes, not bikes, uh, dogs. I meant, uh, and and now he's using his Vietnam survival skills to basically. 
Uh, because I mean, basically, he's, he's wearing his jeans and his vest. That's all he's got, right? And his shoes. So he's he's gonna, you know, so he's basically using his skills to hide up in the hills, get himself some clothing made out of an old sack, tied together with a bit of string, hiding in an old coal mine, uh, get chased by the police and the uh, what we'd call the I don't know what you call the territorial territorial army over here. Um, sort of you know weekend soldiers, you know basically the. Uh, bunch of dumb shits all playing soldiers that get given firearms. They go up there and try and, you know, find him and kill him. And he's using, like I say, using his survival skills to outwit the police and basically survive and then turn the tables on his pursuers, you know, letting out, say, letting out bo booby traps and all this kind of thing. And then, um, you know, but, but, but basically it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's one man. He's trying to deal with his demons, you know, the demons of what he's seen and done in the war comes back. Nobody understands it. I get the fuck out, you know, get out of town, you know, that kind of attitude. They don't want him around. Uh, but being a, being a citizen, he's, he's allowed to, you know, wander around where he likes. He's not, not causing any trouble. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, uh, lay, lays waste to the town. And, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a real, um, I tell you, it's, uh, Probably Stallone at his some of his best acting, where he's he's in the he's in a building, right? He's surrounded by the police. The uh, his old captain goes in, whose uh, name uh, I can't see on here. He's, he's, he's a famous actor. He's captain. He, he goes in and basically he's gonna you know he's he's there to talk with his old soldier in order to, you know, basically get, you've got to give up because you're going to get killed. You know, you're better off, you know, giving yourself up. Um, and then Stallone breaks down and uh, he, he, he's explaining to his old captain, you know, the, 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 the troubles that are going through his head, uh, having all the flashbacks, you know, you know, things like, you know, uh, he'll, he'll, when he goes to sleep, he'll wake up somewhere. He doesn't know where he's at because, uh, you know, he's, he's traveling from town to town. But when he goes to sleep, he ends up, you know, immediately you like you do in the dreams. You travel back there and he wakes up, doesn't know where he's at. And he's, he's, he's basically going through trauma, undiagnosed trauma. He's getting no help for this. And, but, you know, it's, uh, you know, his performance in that is worth the, the price of admission the actual laying out of all these troubles you know anyway worth a go um definitely the best one the second one was just an action flock and i think i've got that oh actually actually there it is all what i said was for this one all right first blood Okay. Um, yeah, so it, it, it's just a, you know, it's a very good film, and it, it's uh, there's a lot of action, but it's more it's more about how this vet is dealing with his mental issues. But well, partly in mental issues, of course, you've got the police chase, and that leads on to uh, number two. When uh, at the end of the first one, he gets himself arrested. He, now he's uh, he's gone to a, uh, a you know a, a, a labor camp breaking rocks. You know. That's what they do. It's what they should do over here, actually. You know, instead of languishing in prison cells, out and get them out there and dig in some holes and break his rocks and stuff. And that's what he's doing here, you know. And then the captain comes to him again. And uh, gets him out of prison because he wants him to go and... Uh, I think he's... Again, a little bit confused. Is it this... Uh, Oh, this one, yeah, he's to go to uh, pick up some POWs. You know, basically, he's got to go in there, I believe, and this is the, this is the second one. He's got to go there, photograph the POWs, get some evidence, and then come back, and, you know, the government are going to probably do something. Um, trouble is, he goes in there, he goes and rescues the POWs, and then the government the agencies who were in there trying to get him in and out, they dump him there. So now he's, you know, he's stranded. He's got to come back and uh, fight his way out. Uh, you know, just an action flick, you know, lots of, lots of explosions, lots of, uh, 
Um, Gunfire, less of a story than the first, but very entertaining. Right, Crank. Okay, I'll hold this up for here for a moment. Let me just... Uh... Oh, George C, 12 thumbs up, two thumbs down so far. That's not too bad. You know, as long as the thumbs up. Anybody want to hit the thumbs up? As long as the thumbs up outweigh the uh, thumbs down. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. Barry Norman, uh, thumbs up. Yep, yeah. wrong ram. Yeah, wrong ram. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, Mad Maz. Yeah, you're right. I, I was actually holding up the second one while describing the first, but I noticed and switched it around uh, after a while. Yeah, you, Richard Cram Kramer. Thank you. Yeah, White Van Man. No, no, no. Richard Kramer plays uh, Captain Troutman, the one. Uh, he's in one and two. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Richard Kramer. That's the one. But yeah, you're right, though. I was holding up to the, the wrong Rambo, but I'll figure it out in the end. Now, Crank. This is the. I think I've got the second one. Yeah, I've got the second one in here somewhere. If I find it, I'll tell you about that. But Crank. Now, this is just a non stop action film. It is like, you know, you, you, if you, you've got to go the, uh, you know, if you need to go to the bathroom, you've got to go before you start this movie. Because um, the, uh, Jason Statham, the Stafe, all right, he is, um, let's see, how does it happen? He, he, he has a problem, he has a problem with his heart. He gets, um, I mean, it's been such a long time, but the general idea is, In order to stay, he, he's got a problem with his heart. His heart's been fixed by his by his mate or something. Uh, but the trouble is that the the heart is failing. The, the heart is failing. <laughs> so what he does, he needs to keep his adrenaline up in order to keep the heart from stopping. If the heart drops, heart rate drops, he starts to go into a cardiac arrest and he'll end up dying. So he has to keep his adrenaline up, and this is why it's this high octane film. So he's uh, he's going around, you know, he's basically trying to get from one place across town to his mate who's going to fix him up. Uh, oh, that was, I, I think some, uh, I, th I think the criminals, I think they've given an injection of some stuff, which is going to slow his heart down, but he needs to keep his heart rate up. Uh, so, so, so basically he's doing high speed car chases he's fighting with criminals he's shooting off guns he's uh, driving motorbikes he's you know everything he could do to keep his heart rate up <laughs> and um you know and, and of course you know every now and again i mean you, you imagine that's not as easy as it sounds i mean you try uh yeah i mean if you're doing exercise you probably do that for an hour you know if you're down in the gym but if you've got to keep your heart rate up you know with adrenaline so exciting stuff dangerous stuff uh in one or the second one, he, he, he takes a policeman's motorbike. Uh, he's uh, he, he goes into a hospital, gets some drugs at gunpoint to keep his heart rate up. It's just an action flick from pretty much from start to, to finish, you know. And there's some funny stuff in there, too. Um, there you go. But uh, it's perfectly suited for the Stath, you know, this movie. You know, him being an action uh, action guy. There we go. All right, what we got here? Actually, before I... Uh, uh, yep, nobody's writing in the comments. Okay, we've still got people interested, so... Uh, oh, right. That's a good thing, because when I pull... I'm not looking at the heap when I pull them off, off the heap here, so it's, it's, I'm, I'm seeing the title when you do. Now, this, Outland. Now, if you haven't seen this, this is one you need to put on your list. Outland. It's actually, I actually watched the, the, the movie that this was kind of based on. I don't know whether this was based on a book, but, but there's a movie. There's a black and white movie back in the 50s. Gary Cooper, if I'm not mistaken, was in a movie called High Noon, which is the same story 
as this, only this is in outer space. So if you've seen High Noon, you'll know. So basically, uh, you, you know, like in, say, Star Trek, all the Star Treks, you know, uh, uh, and that one where they're on the space station. Remember that they had the black captain, black captain Cisco. What was that? DS9? DS9, you got the space station. Everything's bright. Everything's clean. Everything's well lit. Everything's like, this is the total opposite. This is basically an oil rig in space, you know? It's gray, it's dingy. Uh, you've, um, everybody's up there to try, they're working hard, you know, uh, digging minerals out of a planet. Uh, basically, they, 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 they do that, and then they come out, and they fuck all the, you know, but basically, you, you've got prostitutes, and you've got bars, and you've got, you got various different activities to basically fill in their time while they're not digging in the ground on uh, that they're mining minerals from a planet. So you can imagine we've, we've, we've not, so we're basically the only distractions when you're not working, you've got your prostitutes and you've got booze. That's pretty much it, you know? Uh, so you can imagine the, uh, the kind of problems they're going to have with those that combination, right? Because there's, there's no way to, for people to sort of like, you know, get away from it all. Um, not like down on here, here on Earth. You just you can go somewhere, go go to another county, go spend some time with relatives. There's there's nowhere to go. So you imagine. So Sean Connery is the new marshal on this station. The old guy is uh, the old guy is gone or died or something. But there's a lot of corruption. The person who's running the the mining station, uh, he's allowing drugs. There's a super kind of drugs coming where they describe it as you do, you know, uh, 24 hours work in an eight hour shift, you know, one of, one of those kind of drugs. So of course people are, people are getting paid by the amount of quantity that they're digging, the amount of minerals they're pulling out. So if you can do 24 hours work in an eight hour shift, that's going to make you a lot of money. Trouble is they're taking this drug to do it. And after a while it sends you a bit mad. And then you've got people who are, you know, basically going into airlocks without a suit and because their their mind is the mind has turned a porridge, you know, so they don't know they don't know what they're doing. George C some uh nowhere to go. That sounds like familiar today. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, people going a bit stir crazy because there's nowhere to leave. But uh the the, the idea is um so, so the 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 uh, the the, the uh, what would you call him the 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 foreman of the work site he's saying to Sean Connery look you know because he's Sean Connery's new look uh, things just run smooth here which they don't but things just run smooth just come in just let everybody do their own thing don't make any waves you're earning a paycheck just let it be just basically basically just sit in your office and do sod all and just piss off right and don't be don't make any trouble of course sean connery doesn't want to do this he finds that they're you know he finds out that people are dying left and right <clears throat> of the drugs well the drugs are making them go a bit a bit do lally like he's trying to put a stop to it he he try he, he finds out there's another shipment that there's a there's a, some hitmen going to come on the next shuttle to kill him and uh, he finds out about this. He uh, just like the now. This is where it gets similar to the um, the black and white western movie, where is where Gary Cooper, same as Sean Connery, goes to the townsfolk and his you know his sheriff buddies, say, look, the the hitmen are coming into the town. Uh, Basically, I need some help to deal with this. And they're like, uh, yeah, uh, the thing is, I'd like to, but I'm uh, you know, <laughs> you know. They all, they all leave him, you know, so he's on his own. So uh, just like in the in the thing. So that's where the similarities. So basically it's like high noon in outer space. And, uh, yeah, he goes, um, you know, and then he's on his own to deal with the hitman. And, uh, you know, it's very. <clears throat> One, the, 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 there's a few, sim uh, a few familiar faces that people. There's Peter Boyd. He's the he's the uh, the lead. He's the foreman of the site that De Niro goes to. Um, you know, he, you know, because he's like the all knowing. He's been there forever, and he, you know, bald headed guy. Uh, Long Good Friday with Bob Hoskins about the uh, London mafia, London, you know, mafia types. 
he's uh, the, the guy in there, Razors, who slashes people up on a machete. He's in this. He plays one of the hitmen. And uh, the woman doctor, she's been in a whole bunch of stuff. And uh, yeah, very good movie. So that go that should go onto your list. All right. Well, I actually looked at the heap then. What about Bob? Now this is a funny one. It's uh, Bill Murray, Richard Dreyfus. Richard Dreyfus is a psychiatrist. Bill Murray is a patient. But Bill Murray gets uh, lumbered onto uh, Bill Murray. He's a uh, Bill, Bill Murray, psychiatrist, he's had enough. He can't deal with it anymore. So what he does, he uh, <clears throat> he rings up Richard Dreyfus, a, a fellow psychiatrist, and says, look, I've got a perfect patient for you. Simple thing, you know, just uh, go in. And uh, he palms him off on Richard Dreyfus, which uh, to the relief of his old psychiatrist. Richard Dreyfus is about to go on a holiday with his uh, family, you know, to, to the lake. And uh, which doesn't please uh, Bill Murray much because now he's going to be on his own. He's going to, he's got all kinds of anxiety problems. You know, he can't leave the house very uh, anxiety about leaving the house. Uh, he doesn't walk on the cracks of the thing. He doesn't, you know, he has a, a germ phobe the bus and he goes down there. So, so now he's, you know, he, he's managed to wangle himself into the house uh, but it, it, it's, it sounds a bit creepy, actually, but it's a funny, it's a comedy film. <clears throat> and then, uh, of course, he, being the, but because he, he's a, a, got a good personality, he gets in with the family, the wife and the two kids. The daughter was in one of those cop shows, you know, those um, American police shows. Uh, Julie Haggerty is plays Richard Dreyfuss' wife. And, uh, yeah, he, he gets himself well in with the family. They love him. They think he's great. Richard Dreyfus doesn't, on the other hand, because he's trying to keep a doctor-patient uh, distance, you know. So, I mean, he's trying to tell him, look, go back on the bus where you came from, and I'll be back in two weeks, you know. Anyway, all, all kinds of hilarity ensue. Uh, he gets in with the family. Um, the TV crew come round. He gets mixed in with that. Uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of funny stuff. So, so where he's, his phobias, he's got a phobia of water. So the sun, so the sun gets him, you know, on the boat. He says, "Oh, come with that." And then what is it? They, they to, to help him with his phobia, they tie him to the boat. And so, so now he's, you know, he's like, "Hey, look at me! I'm, I'm, I'm over my phobia now. I've, um, I've actually sailed." And you know, one by one, he gets over his phobias. Quite a funny film. Okay, what have we got here? Nightcrawler. Now, this is a very good flick. Uh, it's got um, Jake G G G G Gyllenhaal. Jake Gyllenhaal. His sister was in uh, The Secretary, which I've got up here somewhere. I don't know whether it's in this heap, but if it is, I'll tell you about it. Um, now, this guy is basically. He's kind of a he's, – he's, he's not far he, – he's, he's – there's some kind of – he's not a – he's not a uh, – you know, a, he's very, very smart, but he's a mental case. You know, he knows what he's doing. He's very smart, very devious, and he's he plans a lot of his uh, – you know, but he's just a devious fucker, you know. Basically, everybody uh, he'll use everybody around him to get where he wants. Uh, Bill Paxman's in it, in, in not a very big part for Bill Paxman, which is it's a big shame because I like Bill Paxman's work. He's in it uh, for a short time. Rene Russo is in it. I think her husband uh, directed it or something or wrote it. Directed us anyway, but. But yeah, there's a there's a scene at the very beginning that pretty much sets him out, where he's he's actually driving his car around to construction sites. He's stealing manhole covers. He's stealing metal posts. He's stealing uh, wire mesh. You know, uh, any bits of metal he can steal from work sites, throw them in the back of the van. He'll drive around to the scrapyard and sell it for cash. That's what he's doing. And then, of course, he, he, while he's doing that, he gets confronted by a 
security guard. He gets talking to him with the intention of basically bashing him to make his getaway because he knows that the security guard is standing between him and his exit in the car. So he has to deal with the security guard, but he's been really nice up until the point where he, you know, uh, attacks him. Anyway, so he, 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 but you know, so he's using what he does. He's doing that to make, you know, steal the uh, steal this metal to make some money at the scrapyard in order to um, fund, uh, you, you know, get some money together to because he wants to be a you know a, a reporter, you know. So he'll steal a bike. He'll steal he'll get some croppers, steal a bike, take it to the pawn shop sell that in exchange for a police scanner, you know, that kind of thing. It's all part of his uh, scheme. What he wants to do, you you know, we we don't really have this in England, but apparently, I don't know whether it still is, but it used to be a big thing in America where uh, you've got your news footage. Rather than the news stations having their own crew, or they might have some crew going around, but if they can't get the the house burning or the big six-car pileup, or the guy jumping out of a building in suicide. Jesus. Um, if they can't get the footage, what they do, you've got freelancers like him. They have police scanners. They'll hear about a six-car pileup. They race there, get all the footage they can, and they sell it to the news agents, the news agents, the, the TV companies, and that's what they put on the news. If it bleeds, it leads is what they what they say. And uh, so that's what he does. That's what he, he wants to do. That's why he's doing all these things, because he wants to uh, he wants to get a car. He wants to hire some kid. Uh, he wants to get a scanner. He needs camera. So that's why he's doing all these illegal things, attacking the security guard in order to make off with all the metal, stealing the bike to buy the scanner. And uh, basically wants the guy to work for free, that's, you, know, you know, get him to you know work for free work experience, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and and then because he's such a devious devious guy, what he'll do, he'll he'll go to a he actually he went to a car crash, and before the police and the ambulance show up, there's a guy. He's crashed the car. He's gone through the windshield. He's laying out in the road. What he does, he drags him by the leg or something, you know, into a. So he's so now he can get the body in this camera. The body, in, you know, uh, with him and the car burning. So, basically, you know, because the guy ended up in a hedge, you know, so he drags him out of the hedge, drags him into the road, so we get him and the car burn. That's the kind of things he does. Basically, fucking with some guy that's, you know, half dead, uh, but also messing with a crime scene and all this. And he does this later on. There's a the, a big, you know, nice house. Some people go in there, murder the whole entire family, and they, they, it might be to do with drugs or some kind of criminal activity. He goes in starts messing with the crime scene because he's trying to get some good footage goes in sells it to the uh, poly, uh, to the tv stations that's the kind of guy he is you know and then he's anyway there's all kinds of other stuff but definitely well, this is very dark this is a very, and uh jake jellen hall here i mean you've probably seen him in a whole bunch of stuff um i'm trying to think he's been in loads but he lost a lot of weight for this thing to try and get his face real thin you know basically he's uh uh in a documentary or in, in the extras um they asked him and they said well, what you know he describes himself as uh, you know what mentality would you have your character he said well probably a wolf or a coyote very slim very lean um uh, not much of a conscience you know i don't know that's a, a, a wolf you know characteristic but uh He's very, you know, basically he doesn't care about anybody. Everybody is there to basically be used for him to make a, you know, get to his goal. Very dark, very gritty, very good. Based on true events, uh, some of the actions that he does may not be, may not have been done by real people, but the job that he does is a real thing. You know, freelancers, they'll race to a house burning, hopefully try to film some, some guy on fire, jumping out of the building, that kind of thing, you know, for, to make some, you know, so we can sell the footage. Anyway, all right. Uh, so yeah, that should go on your your your. You definitely want to watch list. <laughs> George C can relate to the brain turning to porridge, indeed. 
uh, uh, hang on, just tune in. That's a great film. Nightcrawler. Yeah, Pablo Mancini. Very good film there. Pablo Mancini recommends the uh, Nightcrawler. It's uh, well, yeah. I mean, anything that I think you should, I'll, I'll definitely point out, and that's one of them, along with with Nail and I and a few others there. Uh, great. Right. Sims Insider. Kui Mark. Great to see you. You're on early. Any vodka? No, I'm on water and maybe maybe some blackcurrant if uh, if the mood takes me. It's a bit early for vodka for me. If I start drinking, you know, the things I haven't really eaten much today. So, I'll, uh, you know, I'll be drinking vodka later, maybe. Great video I watched this morning on the... Uh, Oh, great video. I watched this morning the, the ham and chicken sandwich. Yeah, I uh, basically cut a loaf in half down the middle. So you had a big sandwich, about as big as your hand. You know, it's like oh, ham and cheese and uh, all kinds of. Anyway, I think. Uh, Terry Webster, beer o'clock, I think, Mark. Yeah, indeed. What's it now? Oh, it's just 20 to coming up on 20 to 6. OK, yeah, actually, it will be uh, time in a bit. Yeah, yeah, we've got quite a good crowd watching. Oh, oh, I haven't said that. I just lost one. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, quite a lot of people watching. So I guess people like seeing the, you know, get some film recommendations. Oh, let me move this over here. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll keep going. You know, and uh, as long as people want to. Uh, do some like cooking. Do some like cooking. I don't know what that means, but uh, there'll be another there'll be another video cooking video tomorrow morning. Anyway, oh, children of men. Now, now this is another one you should put on your list. Now, I I must admit, I figured well, it's got Clive Owen. Oh yeah, you know Clive Owen. He's done some he's done some good work. It's got Julianne Moore. It's got Michael Caine in there. It's one of these, which I should know better because I used to own a video shop. There are so many gems out there. You know, like they, they say, you know, don't judge a book by its cover. Well, this is one of those. Don't judge a DVD by its cover. This one I put off for so long. My nose is itching because I need a shave. This one I put off for so long because... I'm looking at the box. And I'm thinking, children of men. What the, fuck? you know, nah. Yeah, but eventually, I, I actually went out. I, I picked it up, and I'm glad that I did. Now, the idea of the story is, for some reason, what we don't we don't know about, the world has stopped producing babies. Okay, people cannot. Uh, I don't know whether it's the, 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 you know, to do with the men or to the women. I don't know what one of the two or both. I don't know, but babies, babies are stopped being born. There's something happened to the population of the planet. It's not just a country wide thing. It's a, a planet wide thing where babies have stopped being born. So you imagine, uh, and then there's a, the, the, the people are shitting themselves because I mean, if you imagine if people stopped producing babies say today okay no more babies are being born starting right now how long would it take for the human race to be extinct ever think about it for about five seconds 80 years how long does the average person live 70 80 if they're lucky they'll reach 90 something so if people stop being born today if no more babies were coming out to today as of today, the human race would be extinct between the next 80 to 90 years. There'd be nobody left because nobody's being born. So anybody being born today would live for the next 80, 90 years. And so basically, I mean, in the movie, there's a guy. I mean, he's a, the, the, we don't see him, of course, but, well, of course, but we, we don't see the guy. But there's talk on the radio about the youngest person on the planet is uh 20 years and four months and three three months four days the youngest person on the planet who actually gets killed you know uh, by some autograph hunters <laughs> so now and it's actually on the radio so now that he's dead the person who killed him gets beaten to death by a crowd by the mob because they know that this guy is a celebrity not i'm talking about the uh, on off-screen kid 
So now it falls to a girl who is 18 years, five months, 12 days, you know, like, something like that. So uh, and that person is the youngest person on the planet. Imagine an 18 year old being the youngest person. So, um, so, so there's a girl, 18 years. So we've got, you know, so effectively you've got 17 years of put before the human race just dies out. Uh, so getting back on track, um, you've got, you got him. He's a bit of a loafer. <laughs> He uh, he goes around to Uncle Kane's house, uh, his uncle or something. Goes around, smokes some dope. You know, basically just uh, loafs off work. There's all kinds of factions going on where, uh, for some reason, see, see, because the thing is, you imagine uh, what, what, there's lots of uh, little factions going on, lots of gangs, armies. Um, the, the police are no good. They're more like a, a, a militia group. You know, they go in and basically they're terrorizing. But imagine if there's only 70 years of life on the planet, there's no point in you going to work or basically improving your life because what you can do is going to be over. There's no point. You can't, you can't um, improve your life to try and improve your children's life, say by owning a house or a business or something like this, saving, saving your money up, give your kids because there are no kids. So basically everybody's out for themselves because they know that whatever i got now is going to be gone while i'm dead so yes so there's uh, there's factions and groups gangs fighting over resources fighting in the streets this kind of thing and then all of a sudden they there's a black girl in here which i don't know the name of so i'll just refer to her as the black girl she ends up getting herself pregnant well of course he's trying to get her um clive owens trying to get her out of the city so she can have the baby, but now there's all kinds of problems because people want to grab hold of her in order to, um, you know, be, be, because if, if she is the cure, I mean, if she's the one that's pregnant, after 20 years of nobody getting pregnant, she's getting pregnant, uh, maybe they can um, harvest her, her blood or DNA or something to try and, you know, so basically they're, they're going to use her to try and fix the world's problems with no uh, regard for her and pretty much her baby, you know, they just want her, whatever she has, uh, that's, that's making her pregnant. Maybe they can use that to, uh, fix the, you know, get the world spinning again, you know? Um, yeah. So everybody's trying to get their hands on her. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I might be understanding that again, but another very good one. Like I say, I put this off for ages, just on the cover. I mean, children of men, you know, there's plenty of other stuff, but I'm glad I, I gave that a go. Uh, oh, Terry Webster he meant he meant to uh, do some live cooking. Well, I can't do any live cooking because I can't get the computer in the kitchen because it's connected to the wall. Uh, or get a takeaway and do a mukbang. Well, that's the thing. I mean, you know, trying to um, trying to get a trying to get a, a takeaway is probably you know taking a risk. What's this? Ah, the taking of Pelham one, two, three. Now, this one was set somewhere in the mid seventies. Getting messages flashing up. This is set in the seven mid seventies, and uh, it, I tell you what, it is a whole lot better than that shite that John Travolta came out as um i don't know when he came that when he did that it was after 2000 i'm not sure well after that that was actually that was a that was a, a shitty remake of this this was dark gritty um basically basically the idea is that robert shaw who you'll remember from the jaws movie Along with Walter Matow, he, well, there you go, Walter Matow. He's he's the police officer. Um, he's or he's the transit police. Walter Matow. This guy is the leader of a gang of three or four men who hijack an underground tube state uh, tube train. Right, they get on it, hijack the train, and basically tell the transit police, "We want a bunch of money. I don't know, a million pounds or whatever, a million dollars, or we're going to kill the passengers. You know, we're going to blow it up." That's the idea. 
and um, of course you got you got Walter Matthau. He's 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 directing everything from the control station. He's in contact over the radio with them, trying to negotiate. What is it you want? How can we help you? Um, actually, let me just get to a couple of messages because uh, I'm getting messages flashed up. Terry Webster, what about you all chip in to send the money for a takeaway for a drunken mukbang? <laughs> all right, let me. I tell you, no. All right, if there's a, if there's enough contributions, I don't want to push anybody, but you know, I'll, I'll tell you what. If if there is enough contributions, I'll ring up a pizza or whatever you want, a chinks, whatever's open. I'll do. I'll and I'll and I'll, I'll I'll ring them up. And I'll eat a mukbang if, if there's, you know, I'll do that. I'll take my, I'll, I'll take one for the team. <laughs> I'll order um, coronavirus free pizza if I can. All right, but, but yeah, if you want to do that, I'll order it. And uh, um, anyway, but the difference between this and the remake with John Travolta. Now this guy, he is, the, he's the leader of a group. Like I say, there's about sort of two or three three guys you know in his gang they're holding up the thing he is so calm you know like like some you know like in sexy beast you've got um freddie bass the character freddie bass played by uh, lovejoy if you ever seen that I, I did a review on that uh he doesn't shout he doesn't scream he is menacing by his demeanor that's what this guy is kind of like. You, he's a, he, I mean, he'll kill people, but he doesn't scream. He, does, he says, this is the way it is. This is what I've done. I've hijacked the thing. If you don't get me some money, this amount of money, by this certain amount of time, somebody is going to die. As simple as that. He doesn't scream, doesn't shout. He doesn't lose his mind. He doesn't get fucking agitated. Unlike John Travolta, who's screaming every other line down the radio. That he's going to do this is shitty acting you know he is cool calm which is very scary when you've got a bad guy who doesn't lose his temper you can tell that the guy actually you know anyway but uh walter Matthau is uh he's funny in this you know uh, he's got a difficult job trying to negotiate with the with the bad guys um there's one particular scene which really sets up the 1970s mentality because remember i was born in 70 so i kind of relate to this uh, especially you know because i'm not kind of you know especially i i kind of relate to it now as an adult walter Matthau, he's the transit police at the start of the show start of the film he is um he's in the, he's in the underground you know he's in the depot where, where they've got all the lights all over the walls directing the trains there's like four Japanese men from the Tokyo Transit Company. They're coming over to, uh, I guess, New York to see how the Americans work. They're following him around. He's basically talking to them. He doesn't. Under, he doesn't really under, He doesn't believe that they even speak English. You know. So he's, a, you know, basically he's gonna. He's like, oh shit. You know, what do I get? Loved? All right, look, fine. Okay. So he leads them around. Okay. Now we got some uh, light. He's talking to them, not knowing that they understand English. He's talking about the lights. Okay. Basically, we take the uh, the train from over here. We send them over there. We try not to uh, get them all jammed up on the lines. Um, you know, and all this, and you know, and then. The situation happens where the word comes in that the uh, London, the, the New York Underground has been hijacked. Walter Matthau says to his friend, listen, um, I've got to go deal with this. Can you go take these four chimps back to the office upstairs? You know, that's what he calls them. He calls them chimps. Can you take these, <laughs> can you take these four chimps back upstairs and just dump them on the manager? Give, let him deal with them because I've, I've got better things to be doing. And, the, and they suddenly chirp up and say, yeah. Thank you very much, but we can make. He's like, oh, fuck, sake. I've really landed, you know, because in that in that one instant, you get to know that the the mentality of the guy, they're Japanese. He'll just speak to them any way he likes, and it's like they don't understand English, fuck them, you know. But now that they do, so now he's thinking, oh shit, I've just gone and embarrassed myself by saying this in front of them when they knew what I was saying. 
I could get my ass chewed from the manager. And he, he, the, the, the reaction he has is like, you know, he's like frozen just for about five, you know, just a few seconds. Oh, God, I've done it now. And then, right, then he's like, everybody's been in that situation where you've, um, you may have said something, not realizing the person is over there or, um, you know, you, 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 what they call butt dialing, you know, you, you, your phone accidentally dials somebody and, you know, it is anyway, but it, it was a funny thing, but it was played seriously. And you, you know, the, the, the embarrassment and anguish going through him, that he's just embarrassing himself in front of some foreigners <laughs> by referring to them as chimps. Can you just get rid of them, take them upstairs, load them on the boss, let him deal with them. I haven't got time for these chimps. But like I say, it's not played for – the whole thing is not a comedy movie. It's a serious movie, but that's just one fun thing that happens. Um, but, yeah, you, you know, uh, it, don't be put off by the Travolta movie. It's the same title The um, with Denzel Washington, who plays – Denzel Washington in the remake plays Walter Matthau. Uh, John Travolta plays uh, uh, Robert Shaw's place in the remake. Don't be put off by the Travolta version. The Travolta version, Travolta version was shite. This is the one you want to watch, you know. But, I mean, the, yeah, the, I mean, there's plenty of scenes. New York streets. The police are trying to, you know, uh, you know, uh, car chase. They're not a car chase, but they're trying to get through the New York streets as quick as they can. Trying to meet the deadline. It, it, it's all, it, it, anyway, probably underselling it, but uh, there you go. Put that on your to-watch list. Um, okay, people are writing to me about what they're having for. All right. Okay. Well, I guess nobody wants to me to eat a McBang then tonight, but uh, all right. Well, sorry. Now, but yeah, I'll do it if there's a, if there's enough interest and, in, you know, if you, if, uh, you know, if 20 people throw in 50 feet, fuck it. Now, if not, I'll just make something else for dinner. Now, this one, Animal Factory. This is actually quite interesting. Um, I wouldn't say that it would go on my absolutely must-see movies, but it is a very interesting movie. Willem Dafoe over here. He is a... I don't know whether he's a lifer. He's probably... He's doing a long stretch anyway, right? He's been there forever. He's got a, he's got a, a what, what, they, uh, what we might call a, a good job, you know, in the prison. He's, he's like one of the trusted prisoners. He's a crooked prisoner, you know. Uh, he's pulling all kinds of scams, but he has an interesting, he has a good job in the office by typing up pots and this kind of thing, which gives him access to intel from the guards. It allows him to get into areas of the prison, you know, if he's transporting contraband from one place to another, he has access because of his job. You know, if there's, if there's an incident, a big riot or a stabbing, you know, he writes out the report because, because basically he's doing the job of the guards. <laughs> In You know, where the guards have to type up a report of what they did that day, they figure, fuck it, get, this guy will do it, you know. Anyway, so that's his job and that gives him access to other people in other areas. Um, what's his name? John Connor over here. Uh, Edward Furlong. You'll you'll rem uh, you'll remember from the uh, Terminator movies. He's a kid who gets busted for uh, a small. I think he, I don't know a small amount of weed or writing a dodgy check or something low level, you know, he gets put in for a few months. Um, and basically he, he befriends Willem Dafoe over here because basically, I mean, he's a new fish. So he's going to get his ass right. And, uh, because he's new and he doesn't know how things work. So, but, uh, Willem Dafoe takes pity on him, uh, takes him under his wing, but th th this guy Furlong, he's no, uh, He's no slouch. I mean, if he if he's getting into trouble, he's he's looking for a knife to sort out any problems that he gets. I mean, he's, he doesn't want to be under his wing too much. And um, so, yeah, it, it's all about you know. I mean, this kid. I mean, the, the way he's going in prison, where he's willing to stab people and murder them to basically not get fucked with, 
he's going to end up being a lifer. Willem Dafoe knows this. He's seen this a thousand times. A kid comes in, he's doing six months, ends up doing 25 years. You know, so he figures, you know, this one, I'm going to take him under my wing. I'm going to look after him because this kid's not an out-and-out -out criminal. He's just, a, a, he's just something, a kid who's done something wrong. He's going to do his time and then he's going to go and do good the rest of his life. Otherwise, he's going to fuck himself up if, he's, if he doesn't get any, any uh, assistance while he's in prison. Um, that guy that's married to Roseanne, Tom Arnold, he's in it. Uh, what's his name? Danny Churro. He's been in a bunch of Tarantino movies. I'll show you the back there. There he is. That's, uh, that's Danny Churro there. He's the one with the tattoos on his chest. Um, yeah, you know, so, uh, so, so basically it's, it's him befriending. Oh, uh, what's his name? Uh, O'Rourke. He was in The Wrestler. Uh, uh, O'Rourke. I can't see his name on the back here. But, um, yeah, anyway. Anyway. Um, yeah, the, 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 the actor O'Rourke. I can't think of his name. Anyway, he, he's in it. He plays a trans of his type. Dressed up in all his freaky makeup and stuff. Uh, so there's, there's a little bit of humour. It's definitely no way a comedy movie. Um, and and then of course they they all try to escape. Then there's a bit of a problem at the end. They all try and get into the garbage truck, but there's a bit of a problem. And uh, you know, but I won't give that too much away. Yeah, I mean, definitely worth a watch. Definitely not on the absolute must see before you die list, but uh, worth a go. You know. It's, um, I, I mean, I don't believe it ever had too much coverage when it came out. I don't think it's one, it was one, one of those, it probably went straight out to video, actually, I would imagine. I, don't, I can't see this going into the uh, the movies. Um, uncompromising, truly chilling, a far more a far more powerful and realistic work than Shawshank Redemption. Uh, Oh, well, yeah, I mean, I, I would say, <laughs> I mean, considering Shawshank Redemption, he, he spends 20 years digging a tunnel through his wall, over the fence and through the sewer. Yeah, you know, uh, this is probably slightly more realistic than that. But, uh, yeah, worth a go. Oh, OK, what shall I pick up here? Oh, yeah, Black Sheep. There you go. Uh Mickey, thank you. Big Eddie Freeman. Mickey Rourke was the, the name I was looking for. Uh, War Ready. Got an impressive collection. Yeah. I mean, this is like half of it. You know, did you do Rambo, Scotty B? Yes, I did Rambo. Yeah, I, I, I talked about Rambo 1 and 2. The third, I think, is the one with the riverboat, and he takes those do-gooders into... Uh, Korea. I've got that, but I don't have the uh, the latest one. I want to get the latest one. Scotty B, 50p. Yeah, yeah, you go down to CEX, you get loads of films for 50p, like hundreds and hundreds of them for 50 pence. Joe Bailey's in the house, enjoying the food videos. Keep up the good work. Uh, Shawshank Redemption, best film ever. It was good, you know. Didn't do very well in the uh, box office, but it, uh, you know, like a lot of films, you know, uh, where the critics don't know shit. It's, uh, you know, word of mouth got about and it done really well. Anyway, back to Black Sheep. Yeah, th this is just slapstick comedy. Um, who you got here? Chris Farrell, Chris Farley. And uh, the name is covered by, it's a bit annoying, the name's covered by the uh, thing here. Gary Boosie's in it. Uh, David Spade. There we go. That's David Spade. That's Chris Farley. Um, Chris Farley's screen brother is running for governor of a state. This He, he plays the dipshit, you know, going nowhere. You know, good intentions, kind of brother, but bit of a you know, uh, you know, bit of a slob. 
his brother's running for you know running a candidate to be mayor or some shit from a, a, a thing. His brother employs this guy to keep an eye on him to help you know generate some business for the for the for his running for candidate. And uh, and, uh, Gary Boosie, who plays the the survivalist who's living in a school bus in the middle of the woods, he gets involved. And, uh, yeah, you know, there's not a lot to say. It's just a lot of slapstick stuff. Um, Chris Farley's always funny. He's done a lot of good stuff. You know, it's funny stuff. (sighs) Okay. What's this one? Oh, Maverick. Yeah. I think this is a remake of an older film. Maverick, you've got Mel Gibson. You've got James Garner, who used to be in the uh, in the Rockford, Rockford Files back in the day, back in the 80s. Uh, Jodie Foster. Now, uh, the, the idea is uh, Mel Gibson here, he is a gambler. He, he saved all his money. And he's going to go in for like a, 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 a the biggest poker tournament of the century, I guess. Okay, so he's he, you know uh, you need like ten thousand dollars or something like that. You know, a big amount of money to um, to even enter. Winner takes all. You got like uh, you know hundred card players all joining on this river boat, and uh, winner takes it all basically. <clears throat> So uh, he's so he's he's having a little adventure, getting from one end of the country to the other, where the riverboat is, where the championship is. Runs into all kinds of shenanigans, where he's playing poker games on the way to, um, you know, to, to try and you know build up the capital because he hasn't quite got the capital. He needs to win all these small games against people. He's a professional, but he's playing against uh, you know silly goofs, uh, you know, in the in the local uh, saloons and that. So he's winning all that money. Uh, problems ensue. Anyway, so he's trying to get from one end to the other to get this thing. He meets up with uh, this guy, who's uh, that they don't sort of they don't seem to sort of get along. It turns out he's the uh, he's the a marshal who's going to be the judge on the boat. Uh, they these two have a special connection. It turns out at some point, yeah, Jodie Foster, she's the love interest. She's doing the same thing, trying to get some money together so she can take part in the. Uh, riverboat gambling thing and uh you know it's quite funny it's quite funny they, they meet up with um some comedy ensues there uh you know he, he ends up losing his money then he has to go get it back yeah it, it's a it's a good you know western movie he's got a the, the funny quirk about him he's got a he's got a funny thing about his shirts he likes his shirts done pristine, which is something that's followed through the movie. That comes up every every so often in the. Uh, oh boy, I don't know whether I don't know how much longer I can carry on going. I've done uh, maybe twenty films. I've got to go eat. I might have to stop this in a while. Just stop and uh, make someone to eat. I'm starved. There are Pablo says uh, there are five Rambo's. Yeah, I've got one and five Rambo's. I got one. Oh, uh, ah, yeah, you know, what? I think I've got one, two, and three. Actually, I might have four. Shit, I don't know. Anyway, I don't have the latest one. The one where he's, he's gone home and he's fighting off the Mexicans. I don't have that one. Uh, right, what's this? Oh, Westworld. There you go. This is back in the day. I've got these years. That's why I spent seven quid on this one, which is, uh, you know, normally I pay like 50p to a pound if, I, if I'm feeling really extravagant for, uh, for, you know, for the NCEX. I didn't buy this from C. I I bought this from um, HMV. You know, they charge way too much anyway. They went out of business because they – they don't know how to sell stuff cheap, you know, at uh, proper prices. Anyway, Westworld with Yul Brynner. Um, this guy, I'm, I'm kind of thinking that he's got a famous son. You know, no old country, uh, no country for old men. He was the, he was the the oldest one in the Goonies. Uh, and I can't think of his name. 
Jurassic Park. It's written by Michael Crichton, who did uh, wrote Jurassic Park. Bro there you go, James Brolin. This guy is James Brolin, the dad of the Brolin, which was in No Country for Old Men. And uh, when he was real young, he was in The Goonies. Uh, He's been in a whole bunch of stuff, but Brolin is his famous son. Not sure who this guy is, but anyway, same same thing. Uh, the, of course, they made a mini series. Uh, I think it's up to season three. I think uh, of Westworld. Basically, uh, a company has developed the technology to make robots or androids that look and act like real people. So what they do, they put the uh, you know they they, they Put these androids out in different scenarios it could be a western it could be a roman scene it could be uh knights in shining armor you know basically so basically you go along you pay thousands of pounds or dollars per day to take part in a theatrical you basically go in and it, the, the whole town looks really realistic all the occupants of the town are or most of them are the androids and they are to re they are to act like that character act like a gunslinger acts like a roman soldier or whatever the scenario is and you being the uh paying customer you go in and you interact with them you can do whatever you like you can shoot them dead you can interact and basically live the life of a cowboy for real or as real as it is um which is all good and well until there's a malfunction you know how it's going to go uh just like jurassic park the you know the dinosaurs get out of their enclosure <laughs> so the 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 androids they start developing problems where they start to uh, go off track and instead of interacting with the paying customers they're out there trying to kill the paying customers uh not seeing um yes yeah, so, so they're, they're out there trying to kill some because I mean, you've got people who are you know being chased by the androids and you know and that's basically what the idea is it's all technology is all good and well until it doesn't you know and um yeah this is kind of a misleading thing on here uh your brenner does get his um face melted by some you know some chemicals thrown on him but that's way later uh so basically it, it's sort of similar to the mini series that they brought out in that uh, basically uh, paying customers come in to use and abuse these characters who are you know the androids the androids either have a malfunction in this case or they could become self-aware in the mini series and they turn on the the people okay but you know uh it's kind of it's a good f low tech i mean it was made in the 70s it's uh, 73 it says here so um while it's good the technology is sort of you know it's dated but we're gonna do it's a uh, but aside from that it's good okay i might i might do a few more i might uh plenty of people interested actually plenty of people watching uh but i really need to go and uh eat shortly so i, I might i might do a few more and then uh cut that go eat i might do it. i might come back tomorrow you know you know maybe anyway this another this is another one that you, you should watch put this on your to watch list uh breakdown with kurt russell now the idea of this movie is uh kurt russell and his wife they're going on a on a holiday across the country they've got themselves a four by four and um you know they're going across country minding their own business the trouble is eventually that they're going along and something breaks down in their car okay in their uh, in their four by four their car breaks down they're stranded at the side of the road but luckily a good samaritan comes along a truck driver comes along he parks up he says um you know what um Look, you know, he's saying, look, there's something bugging up with your car. Uh, I can't fix it. I don't know. But what I can do, he says, look, uh, if the Perrier want to come with me, 
I'll drive you to the truck stop. You can get on the phone. You can uh, you can ring a tow truck. They'll come out and fix you up, which is uh, you know a good idea. Only Kurt Russell wants to stay with the car. The wife goes with the truck driver. And I figured, well, you know, it's going to be safe for the truck driver. And the uh, eventually the car writes itself. If there's a problem with it. You know, something's come loose. He manages to fix it. But after hours and hours have gone by, he figures that his wife hasn't come back. Neither has the tow truck. It turns out, uh, so I'm, try, I'm trying to tell you without giving too much away. Um, I'll tell you that the 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 lorry driver, that the the fact that the car broke down, it had something loose in there, and it was losing oil pressure or something. That was all a big ruse when they stopped to get petrol. Somebody was fucking with their engine to make it stop ten miles down the road. Them getting picked up by the lorry driver was part of the scheme. It was all a bit, or you know, where the lorry driver was in, you know, with a gang. What they do, him and a whole bunch of people, they kid, you know, they find out people with foreign plates, which is something I don't understand with foreign, you know, with the with the American cars. Your car has to be licensed in that state. So if you drive your car from one state to another, people can recognize you as being somebody who doesn't live in this area. Um, you know, so so in this case, it leaves them open because. They know that they're from they're traveling. They know that they're from not from around here, so they're easy pickings. So their job is to uh, uh, kidnap them, um, kidnap people, hold them for ransom. If they don't come up with a ransom, they end up getting murdered and buried in the desert. They you know they steal all the belongings, the car, the property, and all this lot. And uh, anyway, and uh, but the problem is, Kurt Russell doesn't go with his wife. That's what the plan is to get them both together. But because they're separated now, that messes up the plan. And now Kurt Russell is uh, is basically um, putting the picture pieces together. He realizes that his wife never ended up at the truck stop to phone for a, a, a recovery truck. The truck driver, he finds him. Uh, he's denying all knowledge of ever meeting Kurt Russell and his wife. <laughs> um, turns out the reason why later on is because they're one of the bad guys. Quite, you know, it's, it's a good film. It's worth, you know, definitely worth putting on your list. Um, I've tried to explain it without giving away too much, but basically, the lorry driver is in cahoots with a whole bunch of other guys whose job it is to kidnap people and uh, either make them empty out their bank accounts. And probably, I mean, it's pr almost certain that these people all end up kidnapped because if they did let them go, then the police will be over them. So it's obvious that they've kid they kidnap people. Tell them, all right, well you better get over to uh, empty out your bank accounts, otherwise we're going to kill you. They kill them anyway. You know, steal all their property. Anyway, uh, yeah, definitely put that on your your thing. Uh, breakdown. Oh, oh, okay. We're going to. I tell you, I need to. Uh, I tell you what I'll do. Uh, Sterling, do you do you uh, look? Won't let me post the link, so I'll do it in three messages. Okay, putt lockers. I've heard of that. Okay, um, I'll tell you. Well, the thing is, I've done. I must have done twenty-five movies. Uh, I've still got loads left. To do. Oh, actually, that's the Rambo. Actually, this is the. Uh, I'll, I'll do. Uh, I'll do some more. I'll do a few more, but I've got to go sing because I've got to go eat. Uh, this is the second to last Rambo movie. This is not the one with the Mexicans. This is the one before, where he's uh, there's a a group of what they called. You know, do-gooders. You've got some, you know, but basically what they go, uh, aid workers. They go in and uh, in the middle of, you know, warring area countries, they go in, you know, give first aid and all the rest of it. They go in. They're totally clueless. Rambo tries to tell them, say, look, you know, unless you're going in there delivering guns, and you, you're not helping anybody. You're not helping. Um, uh, what, what, what he does, the, 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 uh, the aid workers go in they get themselves kidnapped uh 
later like on some mercenaries show up they want him to take them to where the mercen the the, the uh can't even think straight now. I'm so hungry. Uh, the the, the do gooders have gone. Uh, anyway, so so basically, he's uh, he's basically ferrying the, uh, the these people around. He's telling them not to go in. Rambo takes some uh, some English mercenaries who were sort of running their mouth off quite a lot about how how great they are. They go in. He joins them, and he's got he's got the exploding uh, crossbow uh, bow and arrow and all this kind of stuff. There's a really good scene where he rips a guy's throat out. Which is uh, worth the the price of admission. In fact, <laughs> there you go. You see the top picture. I'll try and hold it without the without any flare. The top picture. There you go. He's ripping some Chinaman's uh, throat off, which is uh, really good. Um, yeah, no, plenty of action. Um, there's some mayhem. He get, uh, near the end, he gets onto a truck with a fifty caliber. Um, gun on the back, and he's just turning people into mincemeat. I mean, these people are like dog food by the time you know these bullets go through. He's just wrecking the place, you know, you know, spraying out his arms and legs coming off because I mean, you get hit by a fifty. Uh, in fact, there's a picture of the what he's doing at the back there, on the back cover. Um, yeah, you know, yeah, the, the the story's okay. Uh, there's plenty of explosions like you would with a a Rambo movie. Um, I mean, if you want a good story, you're going to go have to go back to the first one. But uh, if you want, then this is a uh, this is a very good movie for action packedness. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right. And well, look, what I'll do that's that's it's coming up on. Well, my clock says to uh, it's coming up almost two hours in a few seconds but it probably it might say less than that because the if there's been any jumping all right well, what i'll do um i'm gonna i'm gonna leave it there i'll, I'll leave it at two hours that way it's a it's a, it's a chunk of uh, time that people can put aside to maybe watch the um the reviews i've got a whole bunch i've got loads of them to go but i really need to go eat all right so uh what i'll do i'll leave it there i'll do another one tomorrow yeah i'll do another one tomorrow probably uh what i'll do i'll make a little 30 second video to give you about you know half an hour 45 minutes or so uh you know advance warning and uh okay well anyway um yeah it's a shame that uh yeah somebody somebody volunteered to have a he gets a pizza but that never happened <laughs> all right but uh, otherwise i'd keep going you know but i really gotta stop and eat anyway so that never but uh okay so thank you for everybody for watching um what i'll do I'll, I'll, I'll do a whole bunch more tomorrow and uh i'll give you an advance notice on that and uh anyway thank you everybody and i'll uh leave it there <laughs>